All right, Tim, are we ready? <laughs> All right, everyone, I'd like to welcome everyone to our meeting. This is a continuation meeting of our meeting from the uh, 23rd. No, the 16th, today is the 23rd. It's been a long day. Uh, as I said, we called the meeting to address some personnel needs, probably, and then also uh, get a chance to get updated information from uh, our, from uh, Mrs. McGahat, who is our um, Macon County Health Department's director. As I said, the agenda is there. Hope everyone availed themselves of it as you came out. Is what it is. I will make sure what it stands. There will not be any public comment tonight. This is a, a continuation meeting from a previous meeting, so we will not be taking public comment during the meeting. Okay. Um, I say that for those that came, thank you. Like I said, we're here to try to do what we think is best for the school system and uh, hear the information we have, and then possibly consider action and go from there. So at this time, we'll turn to our vice chair. Would please rise. I turn to Tommy Cave, who is our uh, vice chair, and Tommy, if you would lead us into our moment of silence, please. We all know why we do it, uh, veterans. And this mask last week, I showed it. It lifts everything, EMTs, everything. Had one added I had never thought of, correct, Tommy. And I almost added myself today. I started out this morning to get my second <laughs> shingle shot. Then I had a dental appointment. Now I've got a school board meeting, and my wife came home in between from school, so uh, it's been a good day. But anyway, if we would, we'll bow our heads and think of these veterans of ours and the other in trouble. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. As always, if you would please, please enter our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United, United States, States of America. America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Very good. Thank you. Everyone can be seated. Uh, Tim, would you check? I want to make sure Missy is online. Can she hear us? Okay, good. He didn't hadn't heard you so long. So John's going to make us do roll call votes. So in case you have anything, we need to have you here with us, shall we say? Um, let me go from there. First thing we have is we normally be have what's called our spotlight on people and programs. We'll delay that just for a second. I think two of the uh, recipients that received those awards were on their way. They will be coming, and we're going to try to work it where they can be here when we do that. So what we'll do is move over to uh, informational items. I think the board members, Renee sent out, we do have an out of district trip request on behalf of Dwight Long, who is, of course is our soccer coach. I, I, I looked at this, I believe this is, we, we approve this every year, Dr. Baldwin, do we? Yes, sir. Obviously as long as the, uh, we have the, we're conformed to everything's there. So anyone have any questions? Will we accept this? Presented. I have a motion to accept that request and be approved as presented. Do I hear a second? Second. All right. All in favor, please, let's roll call. Mr. Cade? Aye. Missy? Aye. Hillary? Aye. And Carol? Aye. And the chair votes aye also. It'll be recorded that the motion was approved by a 5 0 vote. Um, you think we should? See if Kathy is available and move into that, and then. Um, yeah, so. Okay, board members. What we'll try to do is, like I said, I thought the other recipients there, so so we don't keep her too long. What I'd like to do is uh, turn, move on to policy, which is face coverings, and um, turn the I'll turn the floor over to Dr. Baldwin as he leads us into our discussion with. Uh, I think we have uh, Kathy and also Julie Rogers. Is that right, Dr. Baldwin? Yes. Sir. Okay. Go ahead. Um, Mr. Chairman, in, your, in the board's packet, you have information from the quarantines and uh, transmissions within the school system um, during school year 2021, last school year. Uh, Kathy and Julie, can you hear me okay? It's difficult to hear you. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's a challenge to hear. All right. Uh, I think Tim says he was bunking up the 
Can you hear us? Is it better now? Yeah, I can, I can hear you pretty good now. Um, it's, Jim, I can hear you, and some of the others I can't hear. Okay. Um, that's right to say. Okay. Yeah. What we're going to do, you guys, is going to move the speaker down. Well, we really can't, I don't think. Oh, that's the problem. Right. That's the live stream. Okay. Um, okay, Kathy, basically, uh, and okay. Julie, what I'm, I'm going to run through real quickly is the information that I have based on last year's quarantines, um, exposures, and possible transmissions. Basically, what I had um, looking at the spreadsheet was we had over uh, 1,288 quarantines from November through May. And if you go all the way back to August, we had 1,861 student quarantines and we had 276 staff quarantines. Does that sound about right? <coughs> yes, it does. Okay. Um, we also had around 224 students test positive during last school year, and 117 staff tested positive. Now, um, in looking at the student-to-student -student transmission, it, it appeared that we had uh, seven at Franklin High School, one at Highland School, one at Bacon Middle School, for a total of nine student-to-student -student transmissions. Does that sound about right, Julie? That sounds about right as far as an estimate goes. Of course, when you're contact tracing, there's no definite as to where an exposure took place, but those were pretty relatable that we knew for sure. Yeah. There may be more, but that's what we knew for sure. Yeah, that, and. and and, and there's no way to know if the exposure actually occurred at school. We simply know that these folks were quarantined and then it was recommended that they be tested. The folks that chose to be tested, some of them actually tested positive and these were the ones, these are the numbers that I'm relaying right now. Um, we did have one, it, the, the best I could tell, and Julie correct me if I'm wrong, uh, looked like we had one student to staff transmission and that occurred at South Macon. Does that sound about right? Yes, that's correct. And then if you look at the staff transmission, <coughs> we had possible staff to staff transmissions, two at Cartuca J, one at East Franklin, um, one at Highland School, three at Macon Middle School, and three within the central office, our maintenance bus garage, the folks over here at the central office. Now, again, these numbers, this goes back to November, and we know that uh, at the beginning of school last year that we did have some staff-to-staff -staff transmissions at Franklin High School, but I don't have those numbers um, from the health department. Julie, do you want to comment on that? It looks like we had about 10 staff-to-staff -staff transmissions throughout the school year. Does that sound about accurate? Pretty accurate? I don't have the numbers in front of me, but 10 was the number I had in my mind. Yes. It looked like we had uh, one staff to student transmission at Franklin High School, one at Highland School, one at Macon Middle School, one at MBI, and three at South Macon. Does that ring a bell, Julie? Again, without having that open and in front of me, it does sound familiar, it sounds correct, but I'm not looking at those numbers currently. So. Now, if you, if you recall um, the, the staff to student transmissions at, at South Macon, there's a pretty good reason that um, there's a high likelihood that that staff to staff transmission occurred at South Macon. Is that correct? That's correct. That's absolutely correct. When mitigation elements are in place and in that particular instance, masks were not allowed to be worn for that particular student. Um, and that was the reason the transmission was more likely to have happened that way. And that was in the EC classroom, is that correct? <coughs> Exceptional children's classroom? It was related to an EC student, yes. Um, so basically, out of 2,137 quarantines last year, 341 positive tests between students and staff. It, uh, we believe that we had 27 transmissions that occurred um, while at school. Does that 
pretty close, Julie, you think? Yes, and that was with extreme mitigation efforts of masking and social distancing. Yes. And and so far, over the past two weeks, we've seen a, a, a number of quarantines. Tim, can you pull that spreadsheet up so the folks can see that? The spreadsheet. The one that the one that the health park shared with you. You showed us last meeting. It's a Google sheet under share the aisles under the Google sheet. While he's pulling that up, um, Julie, we have currently. Ninety-eight, ninety. It just changed while well, I'm sitting here looking at it. Went from ninety-eight, and now it's back up to ninety-eight students who are out. Seventy-three students are quarantined, and twenty-five are uh, have been have tested positive. Do you want to comment on um, how those quarantines have gone <coughs> last week, um, specifically with what you told me this morning about the uh, the football situation at middle school? Right. A lot of the numbers that we currently have have been obviously since today was the first day of school those were proceeding that would overlap into the first day of school so those are some that will probably phase out in the next coming days and and come off of that sheet and as numbers are continuing to grow you know the numbers are going to continue to change most of those exposures are related to um, family vacations household contacts there are some team instances that we haven't seen a heavy transmission between teams, but a lot of those, when you have a positive on a team, um, it can lead to a high number of exposures that go on that quarantine list. Most of all, those have phased off. Because of the mitigation efforts of wearing masks, um, the example that I'm referring to, we did have one team that had a positive student and they traveled and with the new guidelines, no other student was quarantined based on the new guideline of the masking appropriately for both the one that's positive and those around. Um, so we were able to avoid quarantining any other student thanks to the masks. We also have a student and the contact tracing is early. Looking at that, we had a student positive on campus today at Franklin High School and just starting the contact tracing, it appears at this time that I will not have to quarantine anybody because that student appropriately wore masks and so did so far from what I'm understanding the students in, that, in those classes as well. Thanks, Julia. And, you know, we're, obviously we're concerned about the safety of our students, um, our staff, and our community, but, but we also want to keep our schools open and, and not run the risk of needing to go to a, a virtual situation uh, as a lot of school systems had to go to last year and um, individual schools in Macon County had to shift to at uh, certain times last year as well. Um, so I, I appreciate your willingness to work with us on these quarantines and, and to keep our staff in front of our students as, as much as we possibly can so that we can remain in in-person instruction. Um, As in Kathy, Julie, either one of you that, that can chime in here, over the course of uh, the last month, really, uh, I've received a, a tremendous amount of information from folks from both sides of the discussion. I've, I've heard from folks that um, have shared research articles about how effective masks are, and um, I've received uh, the same number of, if not more, articles suggesting that, that masks have uh, no benefit. Um, I've, had, I've, had, I've been asked um, how many children have been hospitalized in Macon County with uh, COVID-19 over the course of the pandemic. What our actual number of hospitalizations are right now in Macon County. Obviously, these are th this is information that, that uh, I don't have access to as the superintendent and I really don't have a way of determining the efficacy of masks uh, when considering the tremendous amount of information that, that 
that I've been provided by, again, both, folk, both sides of this discussion, folks that believe masks are effective and those folks that have research articles that, that say that masks aren't effective. Can you, can you comment on the efficacy of masks, face coverings, um, and why the decision has been made um, from the health department to recommend uh, face coverings? And then also talk about the number of children that have been affected by the pandemic in Macon County and uh, the number of hospitalizations that we have both the children and the uh, general. So we, um, we recommend masks for children and talking about the efficacy of masks. It's from the beginning of the pandemic, um, we have known that masks prevent respiratory droplets from passing to another person. Um, that is something the CDC has known and has promoted mask wearing since the beginning of this pandemic um, and continues to promote that. We know that mask wearing for many diseases that we have had throughout the time um, has prevented disease transmission for respiratory transmissible diseases. Have you been shared this information that the board has received from, from the community uh, regarding uh, a number of uh, websites and articles and videos that, that state that that masks aren't effective. Have you been able to see that information or is that just the board that's receiving that? I've not been given any any information that the board has seen. Um, I, you know, I don't know if it's a reputable site. There's plenty, plenty of misinformation that is out there. <coughs> we, choose, we try to promote that people go to reputable sites that we know that we can count on um, and that are scientifically based. So can, can you provide that? Those reputable sites are saying masks are important for this pandemic. They, can, can you they provide that information the to the community so that, so that these folks can see it? Is there, a, is there somewhere that folks can go to Some see that information? Here. What's sure, that? What I'm sorry, Kathy, what did you just say? Hmm. Kathy, this is John Henning. I'm going to try to relate what Dr. Baldwin just asked. He asked whether the resources that you've been provided that are uh, said to be reputable scientific resources, is there, a, is there a place that the public can go to look for those resources in the view themselves? Is there another way you might share those uh, with the general public? Uh, you'll have to unmute. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Oh, I, that was me, I'm sorry. Um, yes, I can provide you with those links and you can put them on your website and, and you know, read through the, that information. Can, can you talk about the number of uh, folks that we have in the community that are hospitalized with COVID and also the number of children that have been affected in Macon County since the pandemic began? So, um, I can, I'll, I'll review some of the numbers that we have all around. Um, from last week to this week, um, we've gone from 183 active cases to 243 active cases. And as you know, that we have people rolling off that number as well as going on that number. Um, for the last 14 days, we've had 345 new cases. Our current positivity rate is 26.73, so that's lower than it was this time last week. However, it is still in the red zone. Our positivity rate of 26.73 is much is higher than the very high transmission transmission going on in the community. Our 14-day case rate per 100,000 is up to 906. What was that last number? As far as the hospitalizations, um, the information that I have is um, 
for not just Macon County, it's for the Western North Carolina region. We have hospital regions that collect this information. Um, currently, we have out of the ICU beds, um, we have 132 ICU beds in use in Western North Carolina, and 27 of them available. As far as ventilators in, in Western North Carolina, we have um, 78 in use and 99 ventilators available. The, the problem is this really the ICU beds that are being used. We are, have both hospitals in the community have said they are stressed. Their ICU beds are uh, full, and they are asking if we can continue to mask and, and do what we can to help prevent the spread in the community. Those, uh, oh, oh. I was just going to ask, those ICU beds that are available for the western part of the state, the 27, those are for all of ICU cases, not just COVID. Is that correct? That's correct. Kathy, we have currently 25 students in our system who have tested positive, and, and that, that number is um, much higher than what it was in June. Um, 25 is not the highest that we've been since the pandemic began. Do you want to comment on what you're seeing in children at this point? Um, from last week to this week, we've seen um, an increase in the number of children in zero to 17 that are testing positive out of our cases. So we, last week we were at about 11%. Um, this week we're up to 16.3%. So it, it has increased slightly. So the larger number of the cases that we're having are falling in the zero to 17 age group. Do we have any children currently hospitalized? No, we do not. That's currently good. we don't have any child in the hospital. Thank God. Amen. Kathy, if I can interrupt, here in Franklin, you have the number of ICU beds that are available. Are there any available here in Franklin at this point in time? If you have that information. I, I don't have the number, but of course that's a, that too is a, a rolling number. Right. Um, you know, people get offended and discharge constantly. And so at any given point, that number can change, but I can I can definitely get that number and find out for you. Yeah, bluntly the reason I ask, I've been hearing some I don't know, say some stories coming out that are of concern to say the least, of uh, no beds at all and actually we've had cases where people are in the hallways. Can you is there truth to that? Do you have any idea? I've not I have not heard that. I've heard of um, individuals being held in the ER beds, waiting for an ICU bed. Okay. Um, not necessarily in the hallway, um, per se, but in the ER beds. Okay. So basically what we're seeing is that the positivity rate has decreased from last week, correct? Yes, it went from 50, about 51% down to 26%, but 26% is very concerning still. It's, it's not, nowhere near where we want to be. Correct. We're definitely in the red zone. We need to look at our transmissibility. We need, if you go to the CDC site and, and right. look at that for Maggie County. What did they, if you can give me, what are the, the, in the red zone, what percentages, is there a certain percentage that falls within, that's where it kicks it up to the red zone, Kathy? Yeah, they have qualifying numbers, and I can, if you give me a minute, I'll, I can repeat those to you. Um, but they're definitely in the red zone. Um, and it's not just Maggie County, it's the entire state. Okay. Kathy, how many COVID tests did we actually administer? We have 26% positivity rate, but how many, out of, how many tests did we administer? Um, don't have that right in front of me, but I know we're averaging about a hundred a day that we're testing. Um, here, 
Now, we, of course, tests are being conducted at many different places. We've got um, doctor's offices testing. We've got the hospital obviously testing um, through the ER and patients that they're admitting. And all of that data feeds into our county data. So I, I, like again, I can tell you the number of tests we perform here in, at Macon County Public Health. I don't have the number of tests that are being done at the hospital and places like private doctor's offices. Mm -hmm. Tim, can you scroll over just a little bit? This way, to the right. So we, we have had 25 folks who have, who have avoided quarantines, 18 staff and seven students because they have been vaccinated. Do you want to comment on that, Julie or Kathy? Could they hear that? Yeah, could you repeat that? John, you want to repeat it? Yeah, I think the question was that uh, the, the numbers on the uh, spreadsheet show 25 uh, that have remained in school and not uh, been quarantined because they had been vaccinated. Uh, did you want to comment on that? Yes, that's data that we're interested in keeping just to see how many quarantines were avoided due to vaccination. Um, also, we're going to be monitoring to see if any of those that were vaccinated have breakthrough COVID, um, just for some local county data that we can keep up with. I think Jew is actually working on this spreadsheet as, as the meeting going on because it, you know, when I began, it was 98. And it's already up to 100 now. So it's changing as we discuss it. As we go through it. Kathy, can I summarize? Kathy? So, when you're talking about the indicators of that, what determine whether we're red, orange, yellow, uh, the county has to have greater than 100 of new cases for 100,000 people in the past seven days. And the positivity rate over the, the past seven days has to be greater than 10 percent and that's that puts us in the red those two things determine the color that zone we're in so both those factors would put us would not just one but both of those are in the area that would cut that would keep us in the red zone correct correct okay that's why i'm saying that 26 percent positivity rate is is not good, even though we're down from 51. It's not a good indicator. Kathy, when I've spoken to staff and, and even to some parents, you know, I think that um, what I've heard is that there's some level of frustration that that we're we're doing all that we can in schools, um, but we're just a small part of the community, and I'm not sure that we'll be able to. To reduce the positivity rates um, if, if the measures that we're talking about only occur at school. And I think that our staff feel, staff and students both alike feel like that, that um, the school system has had the, the burden of reducing the community transmission placed on our shoulders. Amen. And I appreciate that frustration. Anytime that I'm given an opportunity to talk about this with other groups of individuals considering whether it's mass or to implement any of the strategies that would mitigate this, the transmission of this disease, I am, I am saying the same thing. Please, please do what you can. Mandate masks. You know, you know, try to get everybody socially distanced. I mean, that is something. The same consistent message I'm, I'm, I offer any group that's meeting talking about this. Um, we put out letters to the churches recommending this. Um, we have talked to, uh, you know, commissioners, aldermen, um, we, anywhere I can ask to put, implement these strategies is where we need to be at this point. It's not just the schools. However, by you mitigating, doing the mitigation measures that you're doing, we're hoping to keep teachers in the classroom and students in the classroom. Well, and that will keep kids going to school face-to-face, -face, which is all of our goal. That, that is definitely 
our goal, um, and, I, and I think if you look at the surges that we've had over the past 18 months, they've all occurred just before schools reopened. I know we had a surge, it seemed like last August, right as school was reopening. Then once school opened, uh, the cases seemed to come down. And then after Christmas last year, when schools were closed for a couple of weeks, we had a surge in January. And, and then if you look at the surge that's going on right now, um, obviously school has been out over the summer and um, we're seeing another surge. But the main point of that is that once schools reopened, it seemed like the cases actually came down in the community. Is that what you've seen? And that, that is something that we are hoping for. And we, you know, like we're doing today, we're keeping an eye on it. Um, you know, we don't want to be do this longer than we have to do. We hope that the cases come down, the transmission comes down. So to, to look at the numbers on a, on a weekly basis, I think is um, a very good strategy. Many counties that I'm reading about are doing the same thing. Well, we, we know what happened in Haywood County after, I think it was, how many days was it they were in school last week, John? Two or three? Yeah. And yeah. then they wound up having to, uh, having so many quarantines and isolations that they've actually gone to a, a, a face covering requirement now after opening an optional. So, our, you know, again, our, our main goal is to, is to keep schools open. We don't want to go to a virtual scenario, scenario. It's not the best interest of our students, and I don't think it's in the best interest of our community. I know it's not in the best interest of our community, but I think it'll also help keep cases down if schools remain open. So we're, we really appreciate you working with us to make sure that our students and our staff stay in the classroom. Thank you for all you're doing for this. I mean, I think it's important. Kathy, while you got you, I'm going to look at the other board members. Does anyone else have a question of Kathy? Anyone? Missy? I just have a... No, we, no we, we hear you. Okay. So, um, looking at the yellow and the blue areas are areas where, where we have talked about in the past being more comfortable with them having optional mask wearing policies. But in the orange and red areas, I think that's a moment that we need to look at it and say it's time to do mandated masks. Missy, did I, ask your, did I answer your question? So we, if we get in the yellow, I'm understanding that we can actually do optional masks. That would be an action that this board could take, yes. And that's what I think basically that would be the level that the health department would recommend we get into before considering such an action. Is that right, Kathy? Correct. Okay. Board members, again, I always talk too much. Any, any questions? Okay. Let me turn to the board, and I guess at this point, say, as you well know, last meeting we. Um, Mandated mask, made that decision, which we felt like was in the best interest of students in terms of keeping our schools open. Is Does anyone have uh, any reason that they want to make a change in that decision? Missy? I didn't hear your question, Tim. John, would you repeat it for me? Yeah, Jim's question was whether any board members, uh, having considered the matter last week and now with the update you just got on the numbers in the county, have any desire to, to make any change in your current mask policy? Hearing none. My heart's still where it was. I'm sorry. I talked to a lot of people this week. I wasn't going to say a word, but I am. 
Okay. I'm like you, Jim. I can't keep my mouth up. But a lot of people I've talked to this week, and I talk a lot, as you know, usually. Uh, one or two would like the idea of what we did. Most of them don't. And, uh, I, you know, I don't want a kid to get sick or anything else, but I go out in public. Nothing's happening. We are the ones that are doing it. So I'm not going to say I want it changed because it works. You got the votes. I go with the majority. I'm an old veteran, and I believe in that. So hold on to me. Okay. So unless I hear a motion, this discussion will end. Do I hear any board member want to make any type of motion or anything else? Hearing none. We're moving forward, the current policy will remain in effect until uh, the board has a chance to come back together and to review uh, the stats and then possibly consider a change at that point in time. Okay. Mr. Chair? Mr. Chair? Yes. If there's anybody that would like to be on the September public come in, I'll meet them outside. We can okay. Uh, That'll be fine. For September, what day is that? September. Depends on the board's going to schedule another meeting between now and September 27th. Right. But, but that'll probably, probably be a continuation meeting. It, well, it can be a continuation if you continue this meeting. If you right. don't continue from this meeting, you'll be, uh, you need to call a meeting on 48 hours notice, unless it's an emergency, which right. you can have. Uh, I don't know that you have an emergency to go to, to non, <coughs> a non mass policy, but you can, you can consider it. Um, and also, Mr. Chairman, you're exactly right as to the law on, on public comment is that you're required to offer it at least one time a month at your regular meeting, which you Correct. did already. And so you were not required to offer it at this, this meeting, but it's always up to the board if you want to offer more uh, time for public comment. So you could call a meeting if um, there's a need to consider a change in mass policies. I think you could do that based on Dr. Baldwin saying in touch with the health department about Right. changes in numbers if they give you some metrics to look for. Uh, but if you do end up needing to call a meeting between now and your September or regular meeting date, you can open that up to do public comment if that's the desire of the board. That. Correct. Well, I think one final comment. I think this board has made very, very clear and in plain language. Our goal is to try to get to an off mask optional status. That's our goal. We feel like that's uh, something we're striving to get to. But at the same time, we have to be careful about what we do because, as I said, the interests of the children, they need to be in school. We don't need to be closed due to quarantines or other type of things or lack of teachers to be able to instruct our children. So I think that's what dri is what's driving this whole decision process. And we'll talk about whether a continuation will let the public know. All right, then moving on, uh, Dr. Bowman, I think we're going back to our spotlight on people and programs. We have the recipients here for those awards. I still don't see Mr. Graham or... Um Good. Welcome, Mr. Graham. Thank you. Thank you. We'll pause for a moment. That's it. We're getting a group chat plan over here. Okay. Okay, Dr. Bond, this time, if you would, please. The first person we'd like to recognize is our support person of the year, Ms. Christina Talent. She is a teacher assistant at Cartuca J. She is a roaming teacher assistant, so she serves uh, students across that school and, and supports the teachers in providing for the, the children's needs, whether those are the social, uh, social and emotional learning needs or the academic needs of the entire school. So. She does a great job. She is a very popular person at Cartuga J, and uh, she is our support person of the year, Miss Christina Talent. Next, we'd like to recognize our teacher of the year, Mr. Thomas Graham. He has been the uh, music teacher and band uh, director at Macon Middle School for a number of years. He is uh, a tremendous uh, positive role model for our students and we're very appreciative of his, his services. Thank you very much. And next, uh, 
we have uh, Mr. Mark Sutton, Principal of the Year. Mr. Sutton is Principal of Macon Early College. He's also served as Principal of Mountain View Intermediate School. He has done a tremendous job at Macon Early College. He has the full support of the students and faculty over there. He's been a, a very positive addition at Macon Early College for five years now, six years. I think I'm six. Yeah. And we know who kept him straight, that young man over there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's get forward a little so we're not in the projector of lights. I'll try not to talk to your head, buddy. You want to hold up your biscuit? Since, since they're that far away, can they do a mask talk photo? <laughs> if they would like, sure. Hold the <laughs> <laughs> Lord, yeah. That'll be fine. Thank you. All right, next on the agenda, if I'm following God's train, would be. Uh, I think we do have a personal report. So at this time, I entertain a motion by the board to go into closed session. And I'll go to Mr. Henning to give us our, re our reasons for doing so. Yes, Mr. Chairman, the one set out in GS 123-318.1181 that prevents the disclosure of privilege and confidential personnel information pursuant to GS 115-319-321 and student matters pursuant to GS 115-402 and 20 U.S.C. 1232-B or further. Okay. We have, we've heard from uh, Mr. Henning, do I hear a motion to go into closed session at this time? So moved. And a second? Second. All in favor, say by saying aye. 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 Missy? Aye. Okay, just so we have everybody else here. <laughs> does, that, does that work, John? Yes. All right. I'm not going to report you. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. All right, since uh, I think Bobby is set up here or whatever, uh, we'll, uh, the board will, uh, but, but go over there, Missy's got to state she can't. We can't move her over to be part of the discussion. Can can we, Tim? I didn't hear you. I was talking to Tim. I can. I can make that happen. Okay, so up to the board. So or nothing else. We can always go and. It's going to be brief. Yeah, it's going to be very very brief. So I didn't know if uh, whatever the, the decision of the board would be. Have approval of personnel report. Just pretty much approval of personnel, and okay. that's going to be it, Bobby. And I don't okay. think, Mr. Chairman, if we could say right now, do you think there's any intent to continue the meeting, or, or are you going to continue to a, I don't know. Well, the only thing that will come up, John, as I know, is we'll discuss what, uh, the next time we'll have a meeting, and if it's before our regular scheduled meeting, will it be a continuation or a new meeting? So, of course, that information will go out immediately. Uh, Renee will be putting that out by, as early as tomorrow, based on what we decide. So. Uh, is, is there any discussion of the personnel report? I was going to say, I don't know that there's really any discussion. Let me rephrase that. Um, <laughs> We've looked at it. Everybody's had a chance to look at it, miss you can hear me. So rather than going to closed session, it's there. Um, totally open to the board, just approving the personnel report. We've had a chance for good. If, if there aren't any questions, there's no reason not to do that. So back to the board, do I hear a motion? So what? A motion that the personal report be really approved. Accepted as, as accepted and approved as presented. Do I hear a second? Second. Uh, again, voice call all in favor. Uh, Missy? Aye. Hillary? Aye. Carol? Aye. 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 Board Chair votes aye also. Let it be shown that the personal report was approved by a 5 0 vote. So the final fit thing we'll talk to you is do we desire to have another meeting uh, prior to our next scheduled meeting? And if so, when and uh, go from there. So I'll open the floor to discussion by the board members. Things not going to change. I see that until we get uh, all these numbers. But I mean, they're coming down. Can't we, if we keep seeing them? The Ox in charge of that. He knows the numbers, and we get them every day with him. If we see it, yeah, I would like to go have a call session. But there's no use in doing it now. Wait to see right. what happens, and we can do it. All we got to do is let the press know two days 48, ahead of time. 48 hours, right? 48 hours, and we're good. So I'm 
I think that's the CDC plant by year. information comes out every Thursday, Thursday. now. Right. So play it by year and see what happens. Wait, how long did you say? He said just tell until the know. numbers come down. Not, not set a meeting unless we feel like we have numbers that are gonna change the way right. then you have to give forty eight hours notice. Right. Unless you consider it an emergency. Now I mean I have advised clients that were mask optional that if they decided on bad metrics that they needed to go mask required, that that's an emergency. I don't have any problems saying that. I don't know if it's an emergency. You might consider it one. You can, I guess a case could be made that it's an emergency decision. Uh, you wouldn't have given much notice at that point, but you could do it on less than 48 hours notice. I tend to think 40 hours is going to work. Yeah, right. I agree. Yeah, no. Whatever color that is. Okay, I think I've understood what you're saying, Tommy. We will not have, we're not going to schedule automatically another meeting with a given date. We'll simply uh, ask Dr. Baldwin to review and get that and pass on to us information. And if we see a, a, an encouraging trend at that point, we'll publicize it. And John says have a forty-hour notification and address it at that point in time. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, we, would, we would know on Thursday night. We could go ahead and schedule it, possibly meet on Tuesday. In the following week, something like that. Does that work? Everybody's nodding their head. I'm a, I think yes. I see your head nodding over in your car, Donna Missy. Yes, you, you see that. <laughs> All right, is there anything else coming for the board at this time, board members? We're good. Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. We adjourn. So moved. And a second. Second. All in favor, somebody saying aye. 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 And Missy, aye. there we go. Unanimous. <laughs> Again, as we close, thank everyone for uh, coming in. Bobby, thank you for. Uh, for your work and Tim as always outstanding job as we stream so uh, like I said I'm, I'm proud of this board I think we're doing everything we can to uh, keep kids in school and to uh, further education what's the best interest so at that time the meeting is officially adjourned we didn't have a good first day.